Hello, everyone. Welcome, fellow alumni, and most especially welcome to our young visitors today. I'm Donna McPhee, graduated from Columbia College in 1989, and I'm the Vice President for Alumni Relations and President of your Columbia Alumni Association, and we're so glad you've joined us. Tonight, we have Dr. Indrani Daz, Lamont Associate Research Professor and Glaciologist at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. She will take us to Antarctica, explaining ice sheets, how climate change is changing them, and how that is contributing to sea level rise. She'll do this through her personal artwork and field photographs from her research expeditions. Near the end of the program, we'll have an audience Q&A. Charlotte Munson, a student at the School of General Studies, majoring in sustainable development with a special concentration in business management, will moderate the session. You can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to submit a question. We'll try to get to as many as questions as we can in the time we have. Let me share a little bit more information about Dr. Das. She received her PhD in atmospheric physics from the Indian Space Research Organization in 2007, where she worked on radioactive transfer algorithms to retrieve marine aerosols from satellite data. Her main areas of research include studying physical processes that impact the mass balance and stability of ice sheets and ice shelves, ice atmosphere, and ice ocean interactions. In 2010, she came to Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, where her work has evolved to include both surface and basal processes of ice sheets and ice shells. She also works on paleo observations of accumulation rates and climate history of the Greenland ice sheet. Dr. Dawes serves as a committee member on the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. We are certainly in for a treat. Now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Dawes to Columbia at Home. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much, Donna, for that nice introduction. And thank you to Columbia Alumni Association for hosting me. I'm so happy to be here. I'm going to share my screen in a second so you can see my PowerPoint slide. OK, I hope everybody can see my screen. So today I'm going to talk about Antarctica, sea level, and animals. And we'll have an adventure with science and watercolor. So this is Antarctica over here. Just move things a little bit so I can see my screen. So this is Antarctica. And in nature, there is always cloud over Antarctica. So it's very hard to get a satellite image which, has, which is cloud free. There is always some cloud system, uh, some storm system going around in Antarctica. South Pole is in Antarctica over here. And this is South America for Okay, first a few big numbers. This is Antarctica and South Pole is over here, I just mentioned. Um, it's almost entirely 99.9% .9 covered in ice. And this is how it compares with the 48 states of USA. Um, so Antarctica is a little bit bigger, as you can see, it's a little bit bigger than USA. Um, it has its area is around 4 million kilometers squared, and from end to end is 4,000 to 5,000 kilometers across. It's a huge continent covered in ice. Maximum ice thickness is around 4,800 meters. What that means is an average grown up is around 1.7 meters. So it's if you stack him in, uh, grown ups on top of uh, each other, like Standing head to head, it'll have to stack up around 2,800 human beings to get to that ice thickness. So really thick ice, that's the maximum thickness. Average thickness is around 2,500 meters, which is around 1,400 human beings stacked on top of each other, standing on each other's head. And then um, because it's entirely made of ice, if all of Antarctica were to melt, we would have approximately 60 meters of sea level equivalent. So you can see, um, you can do the math with 1.7 
meters of one human being, you can do the math how 60 meters of sea level equivalent will be. Um, 90, so Antarctica is really huge. Now we understand it has all this uh, ice, very thick ice. And uh, if it were to melt, it will have 60 meters of sea level equivalent. It has 90% of world's ice and 70% of world's fresh water. So a huge continent and here we'll see some, learn some important locations and names. This is in East Antarctica. And Antarctica is completely surrounded by ocean. I'll also talk about ocean a little bit. So this side of Antarctica is called East Antarctica. This is this little part over here is West Antarctica. West Antarctica, you must have heard in the news, is almost always in the news because of two important glaciers, Pine Island and Thwaites Glacier, which is changing very rapidly. Um, and then we have the beautiful Antarctic Peninsula. You also must have heard about Antarctic Peninsula because the ice shelves around here, particularly Larsen Ice Shelf, keeps carving off large icebergs. So, and another important name to remember is McMurdo. That's the US base. And that's where we go. Scientists from US, USA who work in Antarctica go to McMurdo to do our field work. And then the ocean surrounding it is called the Southern Ocean and there are different seas. So this map is available on the internet and you can, you can look it up later to see how, how, what, what are the names and then you can also look at different pictures. Okay, so now we see that Antarctica is really big. So it's, uh, it's worthwhile to try and understand how Antarctica is going to change in the near future because of climate change. And because this is a STEAM session, so we will have a, a science which, we, which I will try to convey with field photographs and um, also my personal artwork. So this talk is structured, how this talk is structured is uh, first half, first we will talk about what Antarctica is, how it looks like, so through, Antarct through my field photographs. And then we will understand what Antarctica sheet really is a little bit of physics and um, what is sea level rise. And then the last bit is the most fun bit I had in preparing this, this talk, who lives in Antarctica. So we'll talk about the animals and birds who live there. And students have sent me paintings of animals and birds of Antarctica. So stay tuned, I'll be sharing those as well. So destination McMurdo. So like I said, you as scientists, we go to McMurdo. How do we get there? So I fly, we will usually fly to New Zealand, Christchurch, and from there we'll take this big planes, the New York Air National Guard planes to take us to Antarctica. We travel in those planes for several hours, six to eight hours. And then this is my, this was my first time on ice. We call, when we reach Antarctica, we call it the ice. So landing on ice, this is my first day. We're pretty excited and it was the first time in, in Antarctica for many of my team members who so we were really excited. It's such a unique opportunity to be in Antarctica and I felt very privileged to be there. The plane looks like this in, in the, on the inside. This is actually a little bit comfier and when we do our service, we, the planes are not as comfy. And like I showed, this is where we go. McMurdo is over here. And these are our, this is our tent where we do our work, our research work. This is how McMurdo looks like. So we live in this, in this uh, apartments over here. You can see, if you can see my mom's. And then there are cafeteria, there is a post office, there is a church. So, and then this is the whole logistics, the whole setup of uh, science support, NSF science support. This is, this is the McMurdo base. And there is also an active volcano, Mount Erebus, my favorite volcano in the world. It is this, it is on is it very close to, it's in McMurdo. And the tent I showed is over here. I'm just facing the tent and the volcano is in the backdrop. So you also must know that Robert Scott was the second person to reach the South Pole. And they did a long, big journey to reach South Pole from, uh, their hut in McMurdo is still there. It is restored now, but you can still see it in McMurdo and it's, it is preserved just as they had left it. And I do, I 
my research mostly, I, I use a lot of data from satellites from ground-based, but my main research, I do airborne surveys. So my instruments are fitted on a plane and then we, do, we survey over the ice sheet. These are some of the photographs of Antarctica from the window of the plane. So these are all uh, very close to Antarctic Peninsula. Like I said, Antarctic Peninsula is really beautiful, as you can see from, this, from these photographs. And we, we, we fly 500 to 700 meters from this, uh, from this surface of ice. That is, we don't fly as high as the commercial aircraft so that our instruments can see the ice surface very clearly or also see it through the ice. So we uh, often we pass these tall mountains near over here, the Transantarctic Mountains, and then the mountains near the coast. And for me, it's I climb, so it's such an opportunity to see all these mountains that I probably will never climb, but they're so beautiful and so close. And this is how um, our planes, the, sur the planes that we survey in looks like my instruments are sometimes fitted on the wings and sometimes fitted on the pod. So this is ice pod. This is actually, we developed it at Lamont and it's still there. If you ever visit Lamont, you can stop by at the lab to see this. Antarctica in the interior looks pretty flat. It's very flat surface. Um, not much is happening. It looks like not much is happening, but a lot of action happens on the surface. But when you take a photograph from the plane, it looks like it's very quiet. And then there are crevasses near the coast. So crevasses are, they go really deep and you don't want to be close to any of them. This is the tent I showed on a clear day. Antarctica looks, looks very nice, bright and shiny, but there are also snowstorms which happen in Antarctica more often than I would like. Uh, snowstorms happen in Antarctica mostly in, in the winter, but also when we do our field surveys, the occasionally we will get a storm or the other. This is just start of one storm and you can see that the visibility is not that good. And this is, I'm sharing my first artwork. I, re, I work on snow, blowing snow and wind events in Antarctica as well. So this is, it. it I really like pictures like this. I like to take pictures which shows this environment that makes me think what the early explorers would have felt when they did, they did not have this opportunity. Like right here, you can see flags to guide us to wherever we want to go, but the early explorers had nothing to guide them. So this is me pondering about what an opportunity this is and what the early explorers would have felt. So from here on few next few slides, we will try to understand what Antarctica is. So it is, Antarctica is really like I said everywhere there is snow. It's made up of compacted and densified snow. It's actually made up of the same snow that you play with. Or you would have made snowmen, you would have made snowballs, and it is the same snow that accumulates in the South Pole uh, and then forms this big ice sheet. Um, so what do, you, what do you do when you make a snowball? You take a lump of snow from the ground and then you apply, and then you apply pressure and the temperature from your hand makes the grains, the snowflakes coalesce into each other and it becomes this really uh, the compact snow that you can play with and roll it around. Antarctica is very cold and in most places the snow doesn't melt for millions of years and the ice sheet forms from this snow depositing on top of each other Right, it looks like they're forming by layers, and that's exactly what happens. Ice sheet is for ice sheets form layer by layer for millions of years when they don't melt. And actually, you can, I can see them with my instruments that these layers, how these layers form. And because this is a very thick, I just said that it is around um, 2,500 meters thick of ice, and on the average, it's very heavy, and then it's it's compacted and then it starts flowing. It starts stop from the top of a mountain. Like I show, I'm showing here a mountain just for uh, simplicity. So it starts at the top and then it flows all the way. Start, so th now we know that the ice sheet moves. Okay, so it's not stationary. Every part of the ice sheet moves. This is a, an actual satellite data map. It's from NASA. And this shows, we don't have to go through all of the details. This is Antarctica. We have now become familiarized with it and it is surrounded by oceans on all sides. 
these streamlines, the finger-like things they see, the streamlines shows how fast the eyes moves. So the bright colors, pink, red, those are very fast moving eyes. And then these colors over here, brown in, this, in the center, in the interior are slow moving eyes. So eyes moves, it's just like something you're rolling down the hill. It starts very slow and then it speeds up when it reaches the uh, bottom of the hill. And in this case, it's uh, going very close to the ocean. So after flowing from the interior to the coast, some of this ice actually moves right into the ocean. So this is a photograph from, from the plane. And this shows uh, the floating ice and we call it the ice shelf. So this is one of my illustrations showing how ice shelf is. Um, a big shout out to my sister who also helped with some of the illustrations. Um, uh, so this is an ice shelf and then why are ice shelves important? So you can see that some part is on lying, standing on the ground, is parked on the ground, and then this is the ground, and then this is an ice shelf, and the, there is the ocean going underneath it. You think, some of you must have started to think, why am I talking about ice shelves? It is, it is already floating onto the ocean. How does it contribute to sea level rise? How, if it melts, how does the ocean increase, uh, height increase? It's because uh, it is important because ice shelves hold back the continental ice. We just saw it it stops the ice, it not stop, it slows down the ice. So if these ice shelves were to break and fall apart, the ice in the interior would speed up even more. So this is why ice shelves are important. So if you were to peel up Antarctica, this would be the ground beneath Antarctica, and then there would be these floating parts, which are ice shelves I just talked about. Um, they are in the primary colors. So ice shelves surround Antarctica. And, how does Antarctica lose mass? So this, is a, this looks like a complicated figure, but let's just look at the ocean, okay? The ocean that I have marked here, and, and this is the ocean that is surrounding Antarctica. Pink color, all you need to remember is pink is warm. If you see pink ocean over here, that means it's warm and blue is cold. So you see in some regions of Antarctica, the ocean is pink, which means that it's, it's really warm and it melts the ice shelf from the bottom. So these are, now I'll talk about two important reasons why Antarctica loses mass, that it's changing rapidly. Because, number one, because of the basal melt. So now I, you have this ice shelf, which is floating out into the ocean, and there's ocean getting underneath it. And here you see an ice shelf thinning. The base is thinning and um, the whole thickness of the ice shelf is become is changing is becoming lesser and when something also thins it can also it also breaks so that is how we get our shells break or it, we call them calf and then it creates this beautiful icebergs but it's actually pieces of this ice shelf breaking off so this is the picture i was showing earlier and these are the floating icebergs one thing to keep in mind is ice shelves will break melt and break, it happens normally, but only when the accumulation rates, the snowfall is more, is less than the amount that is breaking off is when it becomes a problem. And that is what is happening now. The basal melt is a step, the ice is melting more at the bottom than it's accumulating in the ice surface. So uh, that is when we need to worry about, what, that's when we talk about that Antarctica is changing rapidly because of climate. And we will understand a little bit of sea level rise. So ice will melt and it will go to the ocean and it will increase. So if, if you look at the sea over here, it will increase in size once the ice melts. Okay, so that's called sea level rise. In the past 120 uh, years, sea level has risen by six to nine inches and that's 152 to 228 millimeters. This is a 100-year-old woman. Her name is Tula. And she is, she doesn't look very happy to you. This is because since the day she was born 100 years ago till now, that's how much the sea has risen. And um, I'll just briefly mention that this is, this uh, sea level rise is not linear. So 100 years, the six to nine inches right now and the change is accelerating which means the change is becoming more and more it doesn't 
increase linearly. It's a nonlinear change. And this is why scientists are monitoring how ice sheet is changing. And they do it in various ways. So some of the scientists, they drill into the ice to take ice cores to understand what, how the paleo composition, of, what was the paleo constraints on how the ice sheet was growing in, in the past. Um, and then they also, like me, I, I do airborne service. So all my instruments are fitted either on the wing or on the, on the pod or under, on the belly of the aircraft. And we survey the ice sheet from, the, uh, from air. And then there are my colleagues who do ground surveys. They tag their instruments on a truck and then drive it around Antarctica and take measurements. And then there are the, the ship measurements for people who want to work in the ocean, how ocean temperature. I just showed how important ocean is from for Antarctica. And uh, they take uh, measurements of how the temperature and the salinity and other things are changing um, in the ocean. Now, Anybody has spotted the yellow submarine? The submarine is used to take, uh, it goes under the ice shelf and takes measurement of the ocean temperatures under the ice shelf. Um, also, the, uh, yeah. So also there is the very important satellite measurements. Um, we all use satellite measurements and they cover the entire globe, including the ice sheet. And satellites measure how how the elevation of the ice is changing. And from that, we derive, we derive the, the values of sea level that I just talked about, how much the Antarctica is contributing to sea level rise. This is some of the data that I do, uh, that, is, that I have been working on. You don't have to go into details with this, just that see that we work, my radar, I work on radars and they are fitted on the plane. And this is how it, an actual data looks like from the service seas we see features on the surface, we see features within the ice, and then we see features at the base to study how, ice, how Antarctica is changing. And these are some of, the, this is a projection. Again, um, I'll go through it, I, I'll go through it very quickly. This on the y, on the x axis, this is the number of years. So 1990, 95, 2000, until 2017. That's the satellite measurements that I was talking about. And this is the mass change. Let's look at the sea level rise contribution. So Y axis is the sea level rise contribution. Um, for Antarctica purple, all we need to know here is just look at the purple line and see that this is how Antarctica has been changing mass from 1992 to like 2017. And it is a cumulative like from that period, from 1992 to 2017, we have added around eight meter, eight millimeters of sea level contribution. Okay, it's eight millimeters. So we um, we saw before that Grand Matula was standing here, and that was the sea level contribution for a sea level rise from. So this is not only from Antarctica; this is from everywhere. That was the 152 to 228 millimeters. That was the cumulative. The global sea level rise for a hundred years from everywhere and from Antarctica in the past few years we have from 1992 to 2017 we have kind of contributed around um, eight millimeters more so we are still we're contributing in everything all the glaciers and ice sheets we are still contributing in millimeter level per year sea level contribution Okay, so that was, we learned a little bit about Antarctica, what is sea level rise, why it is important to study Antarctica and how ocean is warming. We will understand now, we will talk about, this is the fun bit I was talking about, we'll, we'll see some pictures of who lives here, with the animals and the birds. Only the cutest animals on the planet, I would say, lives in Antarctica. So this is one of my pictures I drew of penguins, everybody knows penguins and everybody loves penguins. And this is actually a baby seal. So this baby seal, the Weddell, is this Weddell seal. Some of you have painted the Weddell seal for me. And this one was born when I was there in Antarctica. We were very pleased to see this baby seal. And when I took this photograph, it probably was three days old. And you can see it was, when you went there, it was very curious to see human beings. It had never seen human beings ever. I would say. Um, 
the mother was just lying there, not very interested. Yeah, she sees human beings every time, but the baby was looking around very nicely. You can see the smile on his, on his face. I don't really know if this is a he or she, but this is the characteristics of Weddell seal. They look like they're smiling, but they, it, it's their face cut. But it's nice for me, it gives a good photograph. And then what do you have here? This is one of the student uh, paintings that a student sent me, Sanvi Aurora. And I just love her painting. These are a few penguins that she has drawn for us. Thank you for sharing, Sanvi. And this penguin is sleeping, I believe. And look at his toes, it's really tucked in, very nice. Thank you. He's a great, these are great penguins. And then Elisa, she sent us Weddell seals. It's, I'm pretty sure she wanted, she would have wanted to draw this baby seal. And she knows that this baby seal is three days old and it is going to be, um, she is probably going to be four years now. And when I went to Antarctica and took this photograph to now, she probably is four, almost four years old. And because she is a baby, Elisa provided this with the baby little seal with the toy. That's very nice of you, Elisa. I love this picture. And then there are icebergs and she also provided a home for the baby seal, I believe that's a home. Weddell seals and Antarctic, uh, in, Antarctic penguins, um, they live on the ice shelves and they live on the a little bit on, sometimes they go on the continental ice, but uh, continental ice means the grounded part of the ice, not the floating part, but mostly they will live on sea ice. Sea ice is, I haven't talked about sea ice. It's a uh, completely, it, it will, it, sea ice is actually frozen seawater. It's different from ice shelves, which come from the continent, from the grounded part and flow out into the ocean. Sea ice is the frozen seawater. And Weddell seals, they live on the sea ice. Many of the creatures, they live on the sea ice because that's closer to the ocean. That's where they live year round. Um, they go out to the ocean to get their food and then come back to rest again. And climate change is going to or sea ice is also, is also in danger of you know, getting melting because the ocean is warming in the same way as the ice shelves. And when that happens, then um, the seals and the different Antarctic animals will not have sufficient place to rest or to, it's, it's their home. So the space will become lesser and lesser and we don't want that to happen. But with climate change, that's, that's uh, a possibility. Um, unfortunately, they don't have homes like this. They live on the sea ice and the ice shop. And uh, like I said, climate change is uh, going to affect them. And then we have Antarctic. I did, I wanted to draw a bird. So I did the Antarctic turn. Um, you should look up Antarctic turn. It's a very beautiful bird. And I really like Antarctic birds because they are such robust, uh, those birds, they live in Antarctica all year round and they look like some, they're sometimes as big as our own birds, but how, how they survive those, that climate, it's, it's a wonderful thing. It's, it's a wonder for me and I really, I really like those uh, birds. So look up Antarctic Tern and see what they do, um, what they eat. And then Ilya, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. She's five years old and she drew this beautiful whale and a penguin. Um, the penguin is sitting on an iceberg over here, I believe, and has ribbons on. This is a beautiful penguin. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elia, for sharing this with us. And Fiona Talisman, she's nine years old. She sent us an, an Antarctic krill. I was very excited with this submission. Um, it's because it's not only that it's one of the most beautiful Antarctic krill I have seen, but also it's, krill is the basis of, it's the food chain, it's the bottom of the food chain in Antarctica every species in some way, in some form of the other survives because of krill. So here I have picked, I have drawn a bird and they live in clusters. So here is a cluster of krill just uh, 
clustered together. That's how they live in the ocean. Um, and then krill is also, I'll talk about how sensitive it is to ocean temperature. So krill here, my sister helped me with this painting. Um, the penguin eats the fish and then the fish eats the krill. I think the krill, uh, penguin also eats krill sometimes. Blue whales eat a lot of krill and also seals, these are weddell seals, they eat fish and the fish eats krill. So you see that this is uh, all of these animal and bird species, they survive because of krill in some, because, in some form or the other. So the krill, Antarctic krill is very important and these are, these krills are very, very sensitive to ocean temperature, okay? If the ocean temperature were to rise, even by two degrees centigrade from where it is now, the krill would stop moving. It loses its mobility. Krill survives on phytoplankton. So phytoplankton is this tiny uh, plants in the ocean, microscopic plants in the ocean, and the krill will eat the phytoplankton. And if it cannot go to look for phytoplankton that is can't move anymore because the ocean is too warm, then it's, it's, it's not going to be a healthy krill and some of them may die. And then the, we have this food source of Antarctica becoming lesser and lesser and it will start hurting the beautiful animals we love. So thank you, Fiona, for that beautiful picture. So now we, we uh, appreciate that the, we now understand that the climate is changing. We understood how ice sheet works and how sea level rises. What are the next steps? We really need to take positive actions now to mitigate climate change. We need, with our own actions, whatever we do, however small way we can help, we should start doing that. So um, our planet is beautiful and we need to keep it as beautiful as it is right now um, for all of these animals and for ourselves as well. And this beautiful uh, ecosystem in Antarctica, we need to preserve and take positive action to mitigate climate change. So I'm almost coming to the end of the talk. What did we learn today? Antarctica is very large and it has very thick ice. It has 60 meters of sea level rise, uh, 60 meters of sea level rise ice contained within it. Um, the ice moves slowly in the interior and then faster toward the coast, we saw that. And Antarctica loses mass mostly by melting of the ice shelves from the ocean and then calving of icebergs that we saw. And Antarctic animals are cute. And climate change, we have to take steps so that the, we can mitigate climate change and safeguard these animals. We have to take positive actions for that to mitigate climate change. And in this way, we can keep ourselves safe from sea level rise and also all these animals and birds that we love from from the effects of melting sea, uh, melting, sorry, melting ocean and um, in, sorry, not melting ice sheet and sea level rise, okay? Um, with that, thank you very much for tuning in today. I thank the Colum Columbia Alumni Association for hosting me and my sister for help with some of the illustrations. Thank you very much. And I will now stop sharing my screen and uh, I will invite Charlotte Monson to help to moderate and take questions. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you so much for that, Andrani. Those drawings were absolutely enchanting and it was so much fun to see the submissions from viewers. Oh, I was so excited. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I was really impressed with that krill. Yeah, um, <laughs> the best krill I have seen and I'm pretty sure it's the best krill anybody else would see. <laughs> Yeah, I have never seen a more beautiful krill illustration. Um, so we already have some questions from viewers. And um, this one right here is, what would life be like in Antarctica if climate change keeps running its course? You've mentioned a little bit of what might happen with the krill and their phytoplankton, but um, do you have predictions for other beings out there? Um, well, you know, to be honest, I'm a physicist and not a biologist. So yeah, I understand that, like I said, the krill is the bottom of the food chain. So if something happens to the krill and it's unhealthy, the animals will not get enough to eat. 
we do talk about adoption, adaptation, not adoption, adaptation, like how does it, how does a, um, an animal adapt to climate change? So those are the things that a biologist would be better to answer. It, don't, it don't, wouldn't be me, but I feel that if the main food source is that problem, then there is a problem with the entire, entire different, all the different species living there. And also if sea ice and ice shelves melt, you know, those animals really don't have any place to live. Basically, mm -hmm. if they don't have any place to rest, to sleep, and to look after their kids, it's, it's problematic. And so also along the lines of if global warming continues, um, do you have any idea how long uh, we might have before Antarctica disappears completely? Well, Antar I don't think Antarctica is going to disappear completely. I mean, unless we are doing absolutely something that the, all of the ice disappears, but I'm hoping that Antarctica, at least East Antarctica, will not disappear completely. Uh, also, if it does, there is a, there is a, we have time. I mean, we have to be careful that this does not happen and we have to start checking ourselves right now because mm -hmm. effects of, of global warming is cumulative. It's not linear, it's right. freezing, right? So if, we, if you are doing something right now, we will feel the effects later on because it keeps adding on to whatever is happening. Right, and so then what are some of these positive actions that we can take at home to help stop climate change? The main reason that we are facing the climate change, the human-induced climate change is our greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So I would say take steps to become green, like don't burn fossil fuels would be one one very big step to take. Check your climate, uh, take, check your uh, carbon footprint. Like be conscious about what you're doing, uh, where you're flying, how you're traveling, those kind of things we can, we can start thinking about. And then there are also some other changes. Food, for example, what kind of food you're eating. That would be, uh, that would be an important thing to, uh, to uh, take care of. And then also clothes, fashion industry. I think every single, every single thing that we have has to, like fashion industry, the food industry, the travel industry, we have to start thinking about how do we make positive changes in our own disciplines. It's very important to start. It's the right moment. You have to start thinking about it right now. So it sounds like then as individuals, we can, we can look at these areas of our lives where mm -hmm. we do have to make decisions, what yeah. we eat, what companies we choose to buy our clothes from, um, how we get from point A to point B, and really make conscientious effort to improve. Exactly. I think every single person has a role to play in it. And only when we work together as masses will change happen. So if each of us, we start thinking we are, we start thinking that we'd make these changes in our lifestyles. I'm pretty sure we, all of us together, we can make this change. So this next question is a little bit more personal about you. Um, when did you know that you wanted to be a scientist and do you have any suggestions for the young people out there who are thinking they might like to follow in your footsteps? Of course, I would love to answer that question. So in school, when I started going to school, um, I was always very curious about things. And I absolutely love to travel. I, I live close to Himalayas, but even before I went to school and even before I started thinking, you know, reading and writing, I used to look at mountains and I would feel like I would want to go to those mountains. And I would like, I took different adventures with my grandfather. So going to those different places. So I think my parents kind of understood that I had that kind of motivation, a little bit of, little bit motivated towards adventure and understanding things. I was good in maths and I could also draw, but drawing was something that was secondary in my life once my parents discovered that I was good in maths. So I think, uh, yeah, my curiosity, I always wanted to learn new things. I always wanted to do different things. And 
I was encouraged by my teachers, by my uh, by my parents to do those things. And eventually it became a habit for me. I started doing the things. I started looking at, I was curious, I was critical about things. I used to I used to like how to make or break things. So I think that for me, a life of adventure and a life of understanding things was what motivated me to come to science. Um, I think for, for uh, since the time I gave my, like I was 15, 16 years old, I was, I probably already knew where I was going to go. Right. So the next question we have a little bit about your life um, at the base, what do scientists eat? Wow. Everyone <laughs> is. Everyone yeah. Is so in McMurdo, we have a lot of variety. So you see that it's a permanent base in McMurdo. Yeah. So, um, even though scientists don't winter over, which means that we don't stay in Antarctic winter over there mm -hmm. during the summer, there are people there who look after this uh, McMurdo base throughout the um, through, throughout the year, and it's a very good facility. We eat. What do I eat? So there, we eat. There is pizza. There anything you can you want, there, and then you'll get fresh food. So we will have. I'm a vegetarian, so I I even. I survived in Antarctica. There was a lot of vegetables, fresh fruit, and there are also canned and frozen things that you can eat. So people, we have different shifts. So if we end up missing the dinner shift, there is there are food like pizza or frozen things that we can we can eat. So so far, and that's McMurdo base. But if you are camping outside, like if you're going on ground-based measurements, like I showed you, take the truck and you'd stay in a tent. And you're pretty much you have to cook your own food and that is when like whatever food that is available to you at the time whatever is supplied to you it might be canned beans it can be fresh food that, yeah. those uh, we have to cook at, at that point right so how long are you staying when you when you do one of these trips to antarctica what's the average i mean it seems like you wouldn't just go for a couple days you you're yeah. probably there for a good chunk of time yeah, exactly. So we are, we will usually be, uh, we'll go at the start of the summer, uh, like October, and then stay through almost through December. So, or maybe a little bit after Thanksgiving. And then we come, we try to come back before the um, after season kind of starts up. So if we go to it, we kind of cannot really go to Antarctica for a couple of days because um, it takes a while to, um, it, it takes all the preparation for Antarctica. We have to have physical train, like we have to have good, uh, good medical conditions when you go to Antarctica, all of those trainings that we go through. And then when we go there, when we actually survey Antarctica, like I showed in the very first slide, it remains cloudy. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's cloudy because of the, uh, and I do airborne, so I really need cloud-free uh, skies. I, I need clear clear sky for good visibility. So we, right. yeah, so we have to wait for a long time to get those, um, all our data in. So it, for me, it takes two to three months to get all of those things and then try to come back when, and then we, we have, we, we cannot just fly back. We have to come back with when the Air National Guard has the logistics support to get us back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was gonna ask a little bit about those logistics. Um, can just anybody go to Antarctica? Do, do you need to have a special permit? Um, uh, how, do, how does that work? So in Antarctica, Antarctic travel is basically for us, scientists is research-based. Mm -hmm. I have to have proposals that have funded our Antarctic field program in uh, to do field work in Antarctica. And those are mainly like NSF programs that support. So I have a, so we have a pro project. If we have a project that is funded to do field work, then I can travel with the, then I can go, then NSF arranges for us to go to Antarctica. That's, that's the permit we need it for scientists, you know, for tourists, that's a different issue. But for scientists like at McMurdo base, which is, all for scientists. We need to have funded proposals and then we take our students or postdocs and then team members to go with us. So after months in the cold, um, what's the first thing that you do when you get home? 
<laughs> I walk on grass. <laughs> walk on grass. That's the thing I miss. Uh, I just take off my shoes and I try to walk on grass. It's always, you saw our clothes, they're so heavy and uh -huh. boots and, you know, big, thick layers. For me, it's uh, like very heavy clothes. And when I come to New Zealand, I come back. So I go from Christchurch to uh, McMurdo. I come back to Christchurch and the first thing I do is I just like to walk barefoot on grass. <laughs> walk barefoot in the grass, not have to not have to bundle up in all of those layers. Yeah, yeah. you see, I'm from India and I, I, I feel the cold maybe more than anybody else. But <laughs> <laughs> I really like to just take up my heavy clothes and then walk barefoot on the grass. That, that, that seems good to me. So mm -hmm. we have one last question and this is about the uh, krill. And it says, uh, curious about exactly how they how they stop moving the water warms and they stop moving does it kill them off or is it i know it's probably more of a biology question yeah uh, I, i try to answer as best as possible but i may not be exactly right in this one um so the krill will swim you saw those little i don't know what to call them i i'm not a biologist i call them hands for now but some biologists <laughs> will be really mad that I said that, but, but they use that to navigate, I believe. And, okay. and then, you know, they, they are, the krills are really small. They're, they're a few millimeters to a few centimeters uh, big. So they are small and it's like shrimp. They're very fragile, I would say. So if, when, when the ocean warms, they kind of, they, they've, I think their body temperature rises such that they are, they are confused or you know they can't move. Mm -hmm. They just lose their. It's the same thing that will happen for people. You know, if you go to an extreme, a hot place, then our body becomes hot. It becomes. I was it, just gonna say that makes sense. I know when I'm I'm from from uh, Southern California, and during the midst of a heat wave like they've been having there for the past few weeks, I don't feel like moving mm -hmm. at all. So yeah. I can imagine similar yeah. for the krill. Yeah, so I think that's how it stops moving. And I didn't want to say this, but they would probably die. Um, so that is eventually, uh, or they would become unhealthy because they cannot go looking for food. That, so they starve, so they don't have, so when the fishes eat them, they, the krill already is already is doesn't have a lot of energy in it to provide good nourishment to the fish. So the entire change weakens up. Well, and we saw from that illustration just how beautiful the curl are. So that's good motivation to uh, think about our everyday actions. All right. Well, that's, it looks like all the time that we have for questions. Um, so thank you, Dr. Andrani, so much. This was just a, a fantastic lecture and the illustrations from you and our, our viewers, I think really, really took it to the next level. Um, I do want to remind everybody about next week's Columbia at Home event, which is a cooking demonstration with Eat Off Beat. So that's a collaboration with Columbia Connects and is an annual tradition that brings alumni together for fellowship. So please do tune in next Wednesday, the 23rd at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. And you can visit alumni.columbia.edu to learn more and to register. So with that, thank you everybody who, who came tonight to uh, hear Andrani's uh, lecture and see these enchanting, enchanting illustrations. Hope everyone has a wonderful evening and we hope to see you all next week. <laughs>